Hello there. Uh, today, we're talking about the collateral damage of big art. And can you put that up on the screen here? Oh, it's not started. Oh, I have to start it. Hey. All right. Well, um, yeah, I should. Uh, there it is. Thank you. So the collateral damage of big art is, is the topic today. It's about the ups and downs of music industry, entertainment industry. I, uh, my name is Sylvia Massey, and I am an addict. I am a gear addict, and I am not recovered, <laughs> just to be straight about that. I, I am known best for lighting things on fire in, in the studio and outside of the studio, <coughs> running audio through cheese. What kind of cheese? Oh, well, this one was a um, uh, Gouda. I suggest Gouda. <laughs> also, um, <laughs> recording unusual and unconventional instruments. <laughs> recording in unusual places and remote locations. And every once in a while, bringing a chicken into the studio, which I've done a couple times. Now, if you haven't recorded a chicken, maybe I, I explain how to do that. If, you're, if you want a special chicken solo, it's very simple. You get your chicken, you mic the front of the chicken, and you wear your headphones, and at the point in the song when you need a chicken solo, you gently squeeze the chicken, and it goes, bakak. I'm a big fan of Sure microphones today. Sure has uh, invited me to uh, come and do this presentation, and I'm excited. So I brought my special Sure microphone, which is a gold and silver encrusted SM58. So you know how serious I am about Sure microphones. Anyway, in the studio, I'm known as a bulldozer, but I prefer to be called uh, a an earth mover because I will push and push to get what I want out of an artist. And that means perhaps making them a little angry or uncomfortable on, uh, at times. Well, where did this all start? Uh, well, I grew up with a father who was an engineer, and uh, he was a mechanical engineer. And he would build electronics in the home, at our home. He built a tape machine. And when I was two years old, he set me in front of that tape machine with a microphone, and he put it on sound on sound. And it just echoed and echoed, and I just talked and made sounds on that thing for hours. And obviously, it had a profound effect on me. My mother was an opera singer, and so the household was full of music and uh, technology when I grew up. So uh, it seemed natural that I would get into this business, but instead, I wanted to be an artist. So when I was really young, I started doing cartoons. This is one of my first cartoons when I was seven. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, my, my mom did the music part. I wanted to be an artist. And when I became a teenager, yikes, <laughs> uh, I became a big problem. And I was um, uh, one of those rebellious teenagers that um, would party and I uh, quit school and uh, was pretty much absent uh, most of the time. And my uh, mom said to my father, who the, the parents were divorced by then, he said, she said, I can't deal with her anymore. I want you to take her. So my dad took the responsibility of uh, taking care of me, and that lasted about a year, and then he kicked me out too. But before that, he said, I'll give you an opportunity. You can go to college. If you get your GED, I'll send you to college. I'll pay for your apartment if you pay for tuition and get a job. So I carefully chose the school I wanted to go to, and I chose the one that had the uh, reputation of being the number one party school in the United States, and that was California State University, Chico. So that's where I went. And I got a job. I had to get a job right away. So I did some graphic design for a radio station. And this is one of my first projects. That's me when I was 19. Um, this was very exciting for me, but not just because of the art, but because I rediscovered music. Uh, college radio at the time was really exciting. And so I got my own radio show. And this, this is when I got to uh, learn about the equipment 
recording equipment. There's a beautiful uh, SM7 mic, it's a Shure, and that has to be the first mic that I was intimate with, and you can see how intimate I am with that one. But uh, I loved radio. I, I really loved it, and the people I was with, we had a lot of fun. I was, um, it was a riot. Every day was fun. And we did a lot of, um, we got in a lot of trouble. Um, there's me. I was the life of the party, obviously. This is my car, the Livewire limo. I painted it. And, uh, and uh, I would document my radio adventures with illustrations. And that was the live wire lizard, a, a character that I invented for um, for the station. But you can see that this is this was my life for for my college years. And I also got involved in a band, that, and I was a singer in the band. And that's me with the bomb right here. <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, you know, there was a lot of fun and uh, a lot of partying going on. And um, and I didn't finish college. Uh, I dropped out, and my, my funds dried up, and so I, I had to go back to the Bay Area. And I moved to San Francisco and was determined to get a job recording music because I, I really discovered that what I truly wanted to do was the music and not the radio because radio is more about advertising, and recording music is really what I wanted to do. So I got a job at, uh, at a studio, several studios actually, in San Francisco, and this is when things started to really move forward. Um, I worked with several punk bands in the in at the at the time in San Francisco. This was a band called the Sea Hags, and that was my co-producer Kirk Hammett um, back in the uh, late '80s. But um, I realized after a while that really, if I really wanted to do something, I was going to have to go to LA. All all the big big projects were being done in LA. And uh, when the opportunities would come up, everyone would hire someone from LA. So if I wanted to be taken seriously, I had to go to Hollywood, and I did. I moved there, I couldn't find a job. I knocked on every studio's door and wound up not getting a job in a studio, but getting a job at Tower Records. <laughs> so you can see how happy I was about that. The funny thing is, is that was the best thing that could have possibly happened because the people that were working there were all musicians, all striving for the same thing. They were looking for their, their uh, fame. So when I connected with some of my coworkers, there was this band called Green Jello that worked there, several members, and they were fun. This reminded me of my college band. They uh, would wear costumes and... Uh, and and I, I used to actually uh, join them on stage. I was a piece of pizza. <laughs> and we had a song called Food Fight. And uh, during a certain part of the song, all of us dressed as different pieces of food would get up on stage and fight. And so I was a piece of pizza during that time. There were other bands locally, too, that were up and coming. This one was Tool. And the, this is a photo from Raji's, a show that they did. Um, and that's Maynard and Adam from Tool. And here I am in the back of the room. And here's Tom Morello. We all, uh, Tom Morello is from uh, Rage Against the Machine. So we all support each other. But I was still trying to get a studio job. I couldn't really, uh, you know, get started until I got out of, of Tower. But it was a fun party while I was there, and I would rarely get to work on time. I was kind of a fuck up, honestly. <laughs> uh, but then, suddenly, I did get a job. I got a job at Larrabee Sound, and this is using equipment that I always wanted to work on and working with artists that I could have only dreamed of working with. Um, and I started as an, a runner and then as an assistant. And then I realized at one point when I couldn't make it to work one day because I had a hell of a hangover uh, that I had to make a decision what way my life was going to go. Because if I was serious and I wanted to make a career out of this and the opportunity was right in front of me that I had to make some hard decisions about it. So um, 
at that time I was assisting at Larrabee, I was assisting this guy, Al uh, Alan Meyerson, and he's Hans Zimmer's mixer today, and he's mixed some f brilliant films. He's incredible. Um, but he looked at me, and he could see I was struggling, and he says, come on, let's go. And he took me to a meeting, uh, AA meeting, and um, that helped me to, um, to uh, lose that, m that uh, um, the monkey on my back, actually, to gain some control over it. So in the, the what happened after that, after I quit drinking, quit drugs, and <laughs> quit smoking cigarettes and everything else, was incredible. I, within a year, I was mixing Aerosmith, and I was working with Prince. I wound up working with Prince for three years. So this was a dramatic, dramatic um, change. And of course, I had r very little else to do because 16 hour days in the studio doesn't allow you <laughs> a lot of time to do much else. But um, it was a great, great opportunity. I worked on this album, Diamonds and Pearls with, t with Prince. And at the same time, um, my friends Tool were up and coming and they got themselves a record deal as well as Green Jello. Both of them got uh, record deals and they asked me to work with them on their debut albums. And uh, at the s uh, in the same week, Prince asked if I wouldn't move from LA to Minneapolis to live uh, to be on staff at Paisley Park. So I, I had to make another huge decision, and this time I chose Tool. I, s I wanted to produce, and um, that was my decision, is to work with Tool. So I told Prince, I turned him down, I never heard from him again. You don't turn down Prince. <laughs> so I went in the studio with, with Tool, and uh, the guitar player, Adam, taught me how to do art on developing Polaroids. And this was really fun, and I could, I could keep my little chops up, my drawing chops, by just taking portraits of people and drawing on them. So I continued doing that uh, for several years. I have a whole collection of these Polaroids. This is Flea from the Chili Peppers. This is Skin from Skunk and Nancy. <coughs> Here's Rick Rubin. And Tom Petty. And Serge from the band System of a Down. <coughs> and Johnny Cash. And uh, the Johnny Cash sessions were really incredibly special. Um, just take a look at this photo of uh, the room at Sound City. We tracked the unhinged album, or un unchained album at uh, Sound City. And you can see in this photo, here's Rick. And here's, here's Tom. And here's John. And here's Mike Cam, or and the, that's Marty Stewart. Mike Campbell, Ben Montench, and there is me. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. That proves it. <laughs> uh, so I got into this whole recording thing very seriously, and I started investing all of my extra cash into gear because I realized that that's kind of the secret to. Uh, to getting it, it's it. You know, you can you can have the the chops, you can have the ideas, but you need the tools to get your ideas recorded. So I bought a Neve console. I had it shipped over from London, and um, I had it installed in the B room at Sound City. And then I started collecting other gear, and I became like the queen of gear. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? I am an unchecked addict of <laughs> gear, and that's why I'm here, right? Gear Fest? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So uh, I have been collecting for um, oh, about 30 years now, and uh, I love broadcast equipment. That, that comes back from my radio days. But I love anything that does something uh, that is useful or unuseful. Um, and so I've continued to collect for years now, and this is one of my favorite pieces, the uh, Fairchild 670. 
stereo compressor, if anybody knows what that is. Yikes, that's nice. Uh, and more gear, here's a ARP 2600. Let's talk about gear. Um, I have a few guitars. I don't even play guitar. I have guitars. <laughs> <laughs> but they're tools, right? Tax deduction. Uh, lots of pedals, lots of combos, uh, analog, um, tape, Mellotron. Oh. And then I've got a collection of your standard studio fare, which is very important. This is a Shure microphone. I hope everybody knows what this is. It's a, an SM57. And I, I started realizing that these, all these pieces of gear kind of carry around the energy from the projects that are recorded on them. And, and in fact, they have gear, there's stories behind all these pieces, you know. And when you buy a piece of gear and you record something on it, there's some kind of something special gets imprinted into that, those uh, circuits. And this particular 57 is not a normal 57 because when I was working at Larrabee, uh, the neighboring studio had David Bowie in it, and he was recording a Tin Machine album. And uh, Bowie asked for a 57 to do vocals, and the studio had not one 57. And I couldn't believe it, So, but I just said, hey, I have, one. I have a 57, please use mine. <laughs> So now, my, that's my secret 57. It's, it's secret because it has Bowie DNA on it. <laughs> Nobody touch it. <laughs> right? <laughs> but after a while, I'm in LA, and, um, and I'm getting a little restless uh, because I've kind of hit my stride. And I'm in my mid-30s, and for women out there who are doing this business, there's a point when you have to make a de another decision. Is it going to be family or is it going to be career? And it's very difficult to do both. I decided at one point that I was going to move, I was going to get married and have kids. So I did that and I moved really far away from LA. I moved to the base of Mount Shasta, bought a 50 acre ranch and got married and um, in the town of Weed, <laughs> California, right? Yeah. And I bought a deep fat fryer and gained 160 pounds. Yeah. But uh, no babies. So no babies after a year. And um, it, was, it became really obvious that that wasn't going to happen. And I kind of had lost my chance because I was so busy with career. OK, I can deal with that. I went back to work. I'm back in the studio, and I'm back producing. So here I am. I have a whole bunch of gear, and I have no place to put it. So I looked for a place that I could start a studio in Weed, California. And I found this old theater. This is what it looked like when I bought it. And I restored it, and I put my Neve in the back row of this beautiful old theater. And it's, a, it's much like this room, where you have um, the console in the back, just the back few rows, and then the clients would be on stage. And it was a big open room. And I started doing open room recording um, just for convenience to start off with. But then I, now I love it. And I track with headphones, drums. And then I start doing overdubs um, it, with the uh, monitors. It's a great system. And it worked so well that I, uh, I bought another building. And I put another console in that building. And then I bought some more gear. Here's an old RCA. And here's, <laughs> here's a Neve BCM-10. And then I went crazy and bought a, a, a uh, J series SSL, which was the most beautiful console in the world, and I loved it. And this five room facility was cranking for about 15 years. And at year 12, uh, I mean, it was it was nuts how much how much business was in there. In in when everything was collapsing around the music industry, this place was was jam packed all the time with people from all over the world.
I had accommodations for bands, and they would come from Israel and from Australia and from Japan and everywhere in Europe and everywhere in the United States. So it was always just so much fun. So at one point, I decided I would put on a festival. And it was called the 4 and 20 Blackbird Music Festival because it's in weed. <laughs> and uh, it was a play on words. Anyway, the first year was kind of a, just a big street party. The second year, it was uh, really successful with ticket sales. And the third year, I really went all out. And um, 5,000 people showed up to this thing. But unfortunately, um, the city, the city, of, uh, the city of Weed is about 3,000 people. Uh, the, the mayor came in and told me the day before the festival that I couldn't sell tickets. He was going to prevent me from selling tickets. So I lost my ass. And I, I seriously lost my ass. I put everything on the line for this festival. And it, maybe it was a foolish thing to do a festival. I think so now that it was a foolish thing. But I lost my business. I lost my marriage. I lost my self-respect. I really hit bottom. So I became really depressed. Everything, I had to sell like half of my gear. No, more than half my gear. I did save the Neve. I saved a few choice items, but pretty much I had to sell everything. And I um, had to move. So I lived in my mom's attic for a while. And, uh, and then, I, then a friend of mine said, you know what? You need to be doing art. You should be doing painting, illustration, anything. And she sent me some paint, paints and canvases and said, get started. And so I did. And I started painting. This is the first time I started painting. So I've been painting. And now I set up, uh, I have a new studio. And I set up an easel. And I paint while I'm in session. And then I got mad. I got really angry at the city of weed, and, uh, and I sued him, and I won. This was an uh, illustration that I did on a big card for the uh, closing arguments of the case in front of a jury. And um, I won, and I was able to pay everyone back, and I was able to get back on my feet again. The marriage was done, and the business was closed. But I met this guy. Chris Johnson, and we opened up a new studio in a church in Ashland, Oregon. And Chris and I wrote this book, Recording Unhinged. And it was a chance for me to take my stories and stories from other producers and engineers and put them all in one place, and I got to il illustrate. And so this is, this is what I just love to do. So here's, here's an illustration that I did that demonstrates the de-evolution of vocals. There's <laughs> Tony Bennett, and then Robert Plant, and then Axl Rose, Jonathan Davis from Korn, and Henry Rollins. Henry Rollins, and, and that's, you know, Maynard from Tool. He also is like, raw. That's what they do. Also, I got to share uh, some... Um, do some caricatures of the people that I, I love in the industry and, and other producers. These are producer gods. Mm -hmm. And you can see Rick Rubin there. He's Poseidon. And also, very important information, diagrams on <laughs> how to do proper miking of chickens and other such things. But life today is much different and, I think, much better. In fact... Uh, I think that if there wasn't a huge crash, that I wouldn't be where I am now, which is I, I travel around the world. I have this freedom to do what I want. I uh, recently was in Mexico City doing uh, producing a television show. Uh, it's an MTV Unplugged uh, show, something I'd never done before. It was a fantastic experience. And I travel and I speak to groups. Um, and I do workshops. I record in very unusual places. Recently, working with the band Thunder Pussy on um, recording in a nuclear cooling tower. That's tower number five at Satsop. And we actually did. I set up my mobile rig and uh, 
recorded in that cooling tower, and it sounds amazing. I also do uh, this one. This is an unusual recording that I did in a salt mine, a half half mile down, um, that you have to take an elevator into the salt mine, and then there's this huge room. It's in Merkers, Germany, and it's a huge room um, it, that you you would you would just freak out if you were there. Uh, and I got to record there. And there's so many other places that I want to go that I'm going to get a chance to go. This summer, I'll be on top of Montfort in the Swiss Alps recording in a hut. And, and I just talked to a client this week about going to the Louvre to record a very, very quiet record. And I'm not sure how we're going to do it. And we'll probably get kicked out. But won't that be great? <laughs> I also do a lot of work with a group called Mix with the Masters and putting on web, um, putting on seminars and uh, instructional video. I'm also designing. I've got some microphone designs that, uh, and I've bought a, 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 a forge that I'll be doing castings for the housings for these mics, and that will that's happening currently, which is very exciting. Uh, I've been working, I got to work with the Melvins recently, and I'm um, a huge Melvins fan. And I also got to work with this guy, Amon Tobin, recently uh, to help him find his voice because he's an electronic musician, but he's never sung before. And I was able to show him proper uh, the proper way to record his voice, and he's actually a really good singer. I'm super excited about this project. And then I worked with this guy. Well, I didn't really work with this guy. I was scheduled to work with this guy. This is Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park. And I've been working on a project called Gray Days, with, um, which is a project he did before Lincoln Park. And I re reworked all the music for it and was slated to be working with him um, on vocals. And then he committed suicide. And it really brought home... Uh, what it is about us as artists and musicians that um, we, um, you know, what is it that, that causes some people to shine and others to burn out? And, and why is it that some people can go through the ups and downs and other people can't? And it's, I think it has to do with keeping your... Uh, inner compass to to keep going in that direction, and because we've lost some other people this this year too. This guy, uh, Tom Petty, and the Heartbreakers, and and I have to think that he was a wonderful soul. And um, how many people are heartbroken with him being gone now? And then this guy. Prince. These people must have been in such pain uh, to put themselves in a position where they would lose their lives. So it brought me to question, well, what is it about these people uh, that where some people have tenure and others burn out? Um, well, I feel like I have a compass that keeps me directed in, in, towards a goal. And the goal is success. This is Earl Nightingale, and he was a, a self-help author who had something very profound to say about success. He says, success is a progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And so what I feel is that my worthy ideal keeps my, my direction uh, uh, keeps me moving in a forward direction. And even when there's setbacks, I readjust and I, I keep moving in that forward direction. Um, and this is illustrated with this fellow here, Wayne White, who I truly admire. He's an artist, he's a musician, and uh, he's best known for um, being the, the art director on Pee Wee's Playhouse. And he... Uh, did all the, the set design and the characters, the puppets and everything. Anyway, this guy's had some ups and downs. And there was a film made about him called Beauty is Embarrassing. And the thing about him is that he talks about living life, living, living life 
as an artist and making art a 24 by 7 lifestyle. Art in everything that he does, everything that he eats, everything that he wears, everything that um, uh, he, how he speaks, what he reads, what he watches, and, and everything that he does, it's, it's art. And I just think that that's a fantastic, worthy ideal. If we're looking for a worthy ideal, that's it. So, but the thing about being an artist is that you're completely naked. And I think that this is part of what happens to people when they're, when they're doing their art. It's embarrassing. Beauty is embarrassing. And there's uh, something to say about um, being in front of a group of people like I am with you today and really kind of just letting it hang out. When you do art and you hang a, a painting on the wall, there's going to be people that judge you. When you do music, when you play it for someone, someone listens, there's going to pe be people judging you. You just have to be really strong within yourself and keep that compass in that one direction so that you can make it through these criticisms and be okay with it all. It's like you're, you're naked in public, really. But art is truly... Uh, a worthy ideal, art as a 24 by 7 lifestyle. And when you achieve that, when you get brave enough to be in front of people and to let it all hang out and let people listen to your music, uh, you become weightless. And I think that this is what we all strive for, is, is just to be ourselves and to be okay with everyone's opinions about your art. And uh, I, so I suggest, you know, Get a, get, just, just don't be shy to go ahead and let people know who you are. And um, sure, there's going to be collateral damage. When you are doing art, there's going to be collateral damage. You, you still have to deal with the times when the world collapses, because it will collapse. And there will be debauchery, and there will be you know, some, some uh, deviant behavior. But, uh, and then there will be artistic torment. There will be times when you don't know if you can keep going on. But you just have to remember to just at times just be grateful for what you have. And you can lift up your arms and you can look to the sky and you can say thank you. Uh, and uh, there's something to be said about all that. I mean, it sounds familiar, I think. So to wrap it up, you can be a bulldozer. I suggest it's okay to be a bulldozer or an earth mover. Uh, and then you can also just be willing to be carried, carried on the wind. Remember, life is a, like a sine wave. There's a peak and there's a valley. Just remember that on the other side of that valley, there's another peak. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to open up uh, for questions. If anyone has a question, I think we have a little time. Yeah. Yes. Well, a lot of times I will allow the artist to take the lead because it is their music. Uh, I will gently nudge them towards one thing or another, and I'll negotiate to get some ideas of mine done. But ultimately, it is their music, so I have to honor what their, their vision is. And in fact, most of the time I find that when I, um, when I just follow their vision... Uh, that something special happens and there's a, a combined uh, collaboration that works really well. And um, so I have to, uh, I can't be precious about my ideas and that's the way I think about it is, it, you know, my ideas are helpful sometimes, but uh, it's not my music. So I, I absolutely can't be precious about my ideas, even though I think there's several albums where if they just listen to what I said, 
it would have been so much better. But <laughs> yeah, yes. Every time. <laughs> Absolutely. However, I have to say that there's some albums that I really like. Like Lateralis is one of my favorites uh, from Tool, and that's something that I didn't do. Um, I especially like the artwork on that uh, on that cover, for, you know, Alex Gray's art. But, um, you know, I have opinions about uh, especially Tool's music, like where it would be if we were still working together. And perhaps someday uh, we will again. Um, but uh, but I, I do really enjoy um, uh, listening to what happens after me, too. And, it, and it's strange because uh, I, th I believe that a lot of times I'll capture a kind of an aggressive, a young energy that, that kind of gets ironed out later on. But anyway, yeah. Yes? Um, in the box. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm an audio engineer, and I yell at people for not using a mic all the time. <laughs> there you go. So I have one thing, a suggestion for a space, which I worked in, called Velichka. It's in Krakowa. It's an old salt mine, but two brothers spent 50 years carving a cathedral out of salt. Where? Oh, in uh, Poland. Yeah, Krakow. Yes, yeah. I'm planning on going oh, there. Yeah, I pr yes. I've recorded something there. But you recorded something there. Yeah, <gasps> Lithuania's first pop CD. <laughs> I'm going to visit my friend. Now there. I have to ask you: Did you find that the walls absorbed the sound? Where I thought that this, the salt mine would be um, reflective, but it's not. Yeah, but this was established in the Middle Ages, so there's little caves coming down. The sound drifts through all the doors. And it's and when you get down to the cathedral, it rings. He's talking about a what was a, a mine, a salt mine in Poland that was carved over a century. No, it was carved from the 1300s, 1300s to the 1900s into an incredible cathedral. That's amazing. So you go down into this thing. Now, I've only seen pictures. Now, and that's it starts in the Middle Ages uh -huh. with at the top, and there's Middle Age machinery, and then it goes down with little chapels all the way down to the bottom. Well, that's something that I've really excited. And when I'm you really slam excited. a door, it rings through the all the... Oh, my. Well, I can't wait to visit that spot and do some recording. Yeah, yeah, did you? Yeah. How did you record? Did you have a laptop? I or? had, back in those days, it was a Tascam DAT machine, okay, a couple yeah. of PZMs. Sure. And I made a mistake. I put a, the PZMs in my coat so you could hear the PZMs go. <laughs> and, and, but I did grab the sound of walking around in the cathedral. The oh, sound yeah. Of, so, so uh, I love doing that stuff. But anyway, in the box versus oh, okay. Uh, Let's analog. talk about in the box versus analog. And I, and I, you know, am I? I'm a flying faders girl. I mix flying faders up until just recently, actually, which is a it's an automated um, system for uh, consoles, and the faders move around. You know, uh, it's analog pure analog, and then I switched entirely into digital, and I got this monster rig for digital mixing with every plug-in, and it's beautiful, but I just didn't like the finished product. I, it seemed squeezed to me. It seemed shallow. So now I do a hybrid approach, so I have a, a couple ways of doing it, and I'll have my in-the-box mixes, and I'll send... Uh, the instruments out in stems, and then stereo stems I bring up on an analog console, which is sometimes the Neve, sometimes I have a loop trotter now of 16 channels, which is eight stems from my mix, and I combine those. I, I kind of leave all the faders at zero, and I, I do all the heavy lifting in Pro Tools. And then I mix through a uh, stereo bus EQ and a stereo bus compressor. And that, um, that I think it just sounds so much better. So I'm, I'm going hybrid these days because I, I, I can't stay 100% in the box. So, yeah. Does anyone else do that kind of hybrid mixing? Yeah. The exact same way. Yeah. I can say into the console on zero 
Zero. Yeah. And it sounds better, right? Way more headroom. Yeah. It's more open. Yeah. 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 You disagree? You're totally in the box. Did you try hybrid yet? Yeah. Ah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I go around and round. Okay. Well, I'm always looking for something better, you know, and I haven't found it with pure digital yet. But, you know, maybe we can change all that. Yes. I bought it for $64,000. Yeah. This was before everyone figured out what they were, you know. Uh, it was in, uh, no, it was 1994. So it was right before people discovered them and, and ripped them apart. So, you know, it's like an old Chevy because it's very simple. You open the hood, you can see, you can look around. He's like, oh, I can just pull, you know. And so uh, you pull a module, you can see pretty easily what's going on uh, with it. It's it's not that difficult to maintain, and it's solid, and it generally is very stable. So, uh, I, you know, up in the woods in Oregon, there's not many techs around, so we kind of take care of it ourselves, and and uh, we've learned to get very intimate with this console. So I know it inside and out and upside down. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Hey. Um, so you record. You gravitate towards a lot of. Gigantic spaces, obviously. Yeah. What's your secret for recording those? Do you do like a room mic, or how, how do you keep? Do you try to have like a dry signal as well as your huge echo? Well, uh, you can always uh, control the washiness by doing close miking and, like you say, doing direct signals whenever there's direct signals possible. Uh, so the it's more about the putting the client in the space because if you say put a singer in a, in a cathedral and get a performance out of that singer it's going to be a different performance than if you put that singer in a booth in a vocal booth so i'll do close miking if i need to i'll put some baffles up around uh, to control the the room but oftentimes uh, i'll keep it open and I'll have a room mic also, just to, to capture that, uh, the beautiful room sounds. Um, but as long as I have a close mic, I, I have a pl uh, something to fall back on. And, it, and I find that putting clients in uh, unusual places really um, brings something else out of, the per uh, out of the performance that you wouldn't normally get. Yeah. Uh-oh. Hello, hi Sylvia. Hi. Um, I wanted you to go into more detail about the uh, the last four and twenty festival. Yes. As far as um, when the mayor said no, like what caused what, what was that? Why was the decision such a devastating one for you and you going on with the uh, festival? Yeah. Caused you to lose everything. Did he pull funding away from you when he said no? So I just want to know. Exactly yeah. What, yeah. It was. Uh, uh, I'd been to all the the. Uh, chamber meetings, the city council meetings. I showed them the whole proposal. Everything was good uh, as far as I was concerned. Everyone agreed to it. Uh, but uh, the day, two days before, the day before the festival, the, the mayor said, no, you can't charge someone for walking down the street because it was going to be a street party again, and I was going to charge people to come in to the, the party. Uh, and he just said, nope. You can't put up. You can't put up uh, ticket gates. You can't sell tickets, and that's what screwed me. So it was a misunderstanding, uh, small town politics, and uh, and yeah, it was, it was a devastating, devastating mistake. Yeah. So I don't know if you're putting on festivals, but <laughs> get it in writing with the city when you do. You know how you're going to sell those tickets. Definitely. 
Yeah, 5,000 people showed up, but I couldn't sell tickets. So everyone had a big free party on me. <laughs> Ow. And then I had to pay everyone. And the people that I couldn't pay had to wait until after the lawsuit. And I, yeah, that was, it was a very dark time. But, like I say, you know, uh, there's always the, the valley, but there's always a, a peak on the other side. So, yes. Yeah. Hi. So you recorded Tool's debut Undertow, correct? Yes. All right. So whose idea was it to shoot the piano for the final track? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, there is a story about that because, you know, sure microphones are known to be uh, bulletproof. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> Not true because uh, we had a 57 on that piano, one of the pianos. Where there were two pianos that we shot and destroyed for that album. And uh, it, it caught some um, shotgun uh, fire and it stopped working. That's the only time that I've ever had a sure microphone go dead on me. <laughs> you have to seriously shoot it to make it go dead, to, to make it stop working. Anyway, <laughs> <Yeah>. 12 gauge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So, I, um, your book is awesome. I love your book. Thank, Thank you. you. That was great. Um, learned learned you through the podcasts you've been on lately with uh, several several yeah. those that do that and stuff. Um, so one of the things as a youth, when I was growing up, music and the art with the book and everything like that, and I see it, you're high into that. Do you have any ideas for this digital age where everyone's just streaming it and no one's really getting immersed in the visual side of what music used to be connected to? You know, if, if uh, and I've thought long and hard about this, and I always thought that... Um, Music and visuals belong together from the beginning. And if, if it wasn't for the fact that uh, the recording uh, technology started with audio only, we would have had uh, video from the beginning. So um, the, I, I think that it's important, as important for any, anyone doing music who's marketing their music to... Uh, to, do, to create visuals for that right away. I mean, it's a marketing tool that can't be denied now. Uh, now, how to do it financially, I'm not sure, because, you know, you, you do a 10-song album, and that means you, you're doing 10 videos or, or more, you know. But I think that online promotion is, is, is really the only way to go with uh, promoting any music today, and that means YouTube and um, visual promotion. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, for me, it was just, it was a way, one, just to learn who's on the album. Yeah, you know, uh, mainly artwork and things like that. Yeah. And it just helped me, helped me as a youngster to be able to connect with the band in a way that I think, you know, YouTube, I guess, maybe right. you can, but I, I, I like I like the I, I miss the physical packaging so much, but, uh, but you know, but this is the world we live in now. I'm not sure if we're going to get back to uh, to uh, the the combination of packaging with music again. Any other questions or any thoughts on that? Yeah. When yeah. you bought the theater, yeah. um, did you look at kind of like a certain type of sound, like an ambience with the place? You know, every band will say, well, we like to go to some hills and monsters to get a certain sound, or even though they got the producer there that would give a certain sound, but the place would give off a certain type of audience. Yes, that that particular theater, yeah, it's it was super creepy and dark, and uh, and so there was kind of a and the town is weird too. It was like a creepy little town and a creepy theater, and er, so everyone would go there, and uh, and I'd fill their heads with ghost stories immediately, and and uh, and then they would have an experience. So, coming to that studio was more than just a recording experience. It was really um, 
a lifetime adventure. And um, so I, I, to this day, I, I try to make any recording um, that I do an, an, an adventure for my client and a, an adventure for myself, too, whether I'm in a theater or not. That theater was cavernous. The other thing I liked about that particular space, besides it having its own bizarre character, is that it was it, you could get everything from a, the quietest, most intimate recording to... Uh, to a, a, a giant cavernous sound. The drums were unbelievable in there, uh, depending on the project that you're recording. But uh, yeah, it was a versatile space too. And uh, and yeah, there, there's uh, unforgettable uh, projects done in there. Uh, yes, I, hi. I just have a question about the chicken. Um, <laughs> Just because I'm wondering, is was there a chicken sound that was needed for the song? Was it an idea? Is there a preferred breed of chicken? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the uh, what was it? The rock rock bar chicken. Okay. Does anyone know what the 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 what is it? Bard rock, bard rock chicken. Yes, which is the the gray stripey. Uh, her name was Gertrude. She was one of my chickens, and um, so I would bring her in the studio every once in a while. And it was just to, uh, it was really for a subliminal thing more than anything, because um, during the Tool record recordings, I would do some subliminal uh, sounds that wouldn't necessarily make sense. Like on Tool, during, in Opiate, the song Opiate on the first Tool record, uh, there was a big drum solo, and I subliminally put a, a telephone ringing in the background, so you're cranking the ra you know you're cranking your your stereo, and you've got this big drum solo happening, and then you hear the phone ringing, and you're like, fuck, turn it down. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, look for that later. It it's it's a three dimensional thing. It happens right about here. Um, but for the ch so I thought, well, what about a chicken solo? In the there was two albums that I did it on, and one was uh, Tall Man, and the other one was Anti Product, and so I oh, timed the chicken and the squawk, and then threw it in a subliminal spot so that you have to really listen for it, and you and you're like, what the heck is that? You're just gonna want to go be a farmer. <laughs> What's S that? Subliminally, you're just gonna make yeah, it you'll go be, be like, or, or suddenly you want an omelet or something. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Good question. Anyway, now you know. How are we doing? Five minutes. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. What's the most challenging remote uh, recording session you've had? Mm, well, this was challenging only because I wasn't able to do it myself, that I had to send an engineer out to do it. I was working in a shipyard in Norway, in Bergen, Norway, and my engineer was a, a submariner. He actually was in the uh, the Norwegian Navy, and he talked about recording on a submarine, and uh, which hadn't been done. So I thought, well, pff, why don't we record on the submarine? Let's record bass in a torpedo tube. <laughs> so uh, we got our rigs together, got the laptop together, and went down there. And the Navy would not let me on the ship. They just said no. So I had to allow my engineer to go in and actually recorded a fantastic bass track in the torpedo tube, and it sounds amazing. But that's one I missed. Um, let's see, what else recently? Uh, one really exciting one that I recorded on tape was recording in, a, um, in the back of a moving van. I recorded a band in the back of a moving van in San Francisco while we're going down Lombard Street, this one like this. <laughs> That was that was a bit difficult too, but yeah, there's so many things out there to do. You know, I think uh, one one thing I would like to do, uh, if I can find the right client to fund the project, but there is a, an underwater laboratory in Florida that um, you can rent, and you have to scuba dive to get to it. But I figure. If we and you can only carry things about this big in these waterproof containers to go down in there, but um, and it's about a hundred feet underwater. 
I want to test air pressure underwater and to see how it changes audio. So uh, I would like to go down to this underwater laboratory and stay there for a week with a client and do a bunch of recording um, to, and just see what happens with that. Anyway, I'm sure all of you have brilliant ideas on what to do, right? <laughs> Anything else? Helmets? That's not a bad idea. In fact, I know where a helmet is that I could buy, actually. Um, I also thought about gas mask, too. Gas mask vocals. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. <laughs> yes. Okay. Immersive audio. No, no, I'm not. Uh, I, I, um, I'm pretty simple still. I'm not doing. Yeah, that was an old system, an RSS, Roland RSS system. Uh, but I haven't found the digital equivalent to that yet that I've been able to use. So, But that RSS system, you'd be able to move it behind your head. Do you know of a, a plugin that does that now? What is it? Okay. Yes, I've seen their uh, devices for that. It's a new frontier for me. <laughs> I'm still working on the 5.1. <laughs> so we can do one more quickly. Okay, one more question. How's that RSS thing work? Yeah, it was a. Yeah, it was a. Uh, uh, it was it was just controlled with these little spinners. It had a, a base unit and then the controller, uh, and it was so simple to use, and it really w worked. No, no, you're working with stereo speakers. Yet for some reason, it would throw through phase. It would throw the sound off into the back, and and I'm really interested in finding a digital equivalent to that without additional speakers. Yeah. I'm creeping in. Oh, okay. <laughs> that gentleman's had his hand up for about five minutes. So oh, yeah. You can be quick. Please. I just was, at, I was wondering, so you obviously hold a lot of stock in auras, kind of, and it's not so much about the sound as also making the artist feel like they're in a space that they feel is haunted or sacred or special. Do you think that the sound alone is something that will kind of sneak up on the listener and give it a special sauce, or is it about the listener also knowing that, whether through visuals or just like uh, advertising, like we recorded this in a submarine or something, is it enough to give it that, so that they'll hear it on the record and you, do you think it should be advertised as well? Super quick question. I have a thought about that. <laughs> I have a thought, I, I have thoughts on that and that is that the way that you record, where you record, uh, the environment and, and uh, um, how you do this type of recording um, is imprinted into the sound. So if you are having fun, you're going to hear it. Even if you have no idea how it was recorded, there will be something in that sound that translates from that adventure. And I, I honestly believe that's true because uh, I've seen it again and again. That there's something special that happens when you... Uh, collaborate with an artist to, to do something unusual and fun in the studio. Sylvia Massey.